Welcome to the NTEB Radio Bible Study with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Wednesday night edition of the Rightly Dividing Bible Study. My name is Jeff Greider, and I am the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight we are coming to you live from the brand new NTEB Recording Studios here in beautiful St. Augustine, Florida. And for the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight's topic understanding the Jewish fall feast days and how they might relate to actively unfolding current events in 2020. On this episode of Rightly Dividing, we are taking a fresh look at the Jewish fall feast days of the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, the first of which begins this Friday in Israel at sundown on the Sabbath. We will look at not only these feast days, but also to see if there might be any kind of a connection between the Jewish fall feast days and all this crazy end time stuff that we've been experiencing in 2020, but especially the things that have been going on this week related to the Abraham Accords that were signed yesterday in Washington, D.C., Bible prophecy doesn't get any fresher than this. It is literally leaping off the pages of your King James Bible and onto the headlines of the nightly news. It's a, it's a very exciting time to be alive and an excellent time to dive into God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for waking us up today. We thank you, Lord, for the food on the table, the clothes on our back, the roof over our head, and you take care of all of our needs, Lord. We we played that song earlier, His Eye is on the Sparrow, and uh, your eye certainly is, Lord. And we can come to you and we can come boldly before the throne of grace and crying, Abba, Father. And we know, Lord, because you have saved us, you will hear us and you will answer us. And we commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, and we pray a special blessing on anyone who's listening tonight who might be lost, Lord, and uh, that they would come in lost, but they would leave saved and headed for heaven. And we just pray, Father God, that something would be said and done tonight that would lead a lost person to you. And for those of us who are saved, Lord, we just ask you to meet with us by the power of your Holy Spirit and open up your word in a new and fresh way and just give us something that you know we need. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, Again, I just want to thank everybody who's been praying for me as I work to get my health under control, but uh, God's hand is on me, absolutely, and uh, your prayers are very, very, very much appreciated, and I am feeling better. I am feeling my old uh, energy levels returning, and uh, Phyllis asked me if I was 100% yet, and I said, no, um, I was about 92 maybe 93% right now, but that's a whole lot better than the 55% that I felt like a week and a half ago. So God is good, and uh, one way or the other, he's going to heal you, and he's going to heal me. And I also want you to keep in your prayers um, a good Christian brother who goes to my church. His name is Brother Jesse and uh, his wife, Judy. Jesse uh, has been diagnosed with stage four cancer, and if you could just add him to your prayer list, and we're going to pray at the end of tonight's show, but if you could just remember Brother Jesse from my church and his wife, Judy, and that God would give him a special blessing, uh, that would be great. They would appreciate it, and I would appreciate it. Yesterday, Benjamin Netanyahu, speaking of the Abraham Accords peace treaty signing at the White House, said this, this day, he said, heralds a new dawn of of peace. It was a beautiful ceremony. The music was so lush and rich as they were walking down the steps of the White House into, I think it was into the Rose Garden, but down those beautiful circular steps. And my daughter Kelsey came running and she thought I was watching a Disney movie. And uh, 
the music was very much like a Disney movie. It was really good. And uh, we we got to see the representatives of the United States and um, uh, Israel and the United Arab Emirates and the nation of Bahrain. And they all got around a table and they started to sign the Abraham Peace Accords. Um, when Donald Trump and Jared Kushner rolled this out back on August 13th, uh, it was called the Abraham Accord Singular. And now that we have our second nation, Bahrain, they have changed the name to plural, the Abraham Accords. And um, I got a special chill down the back of my spine watching this happen and thinking about how amazing it is that I have been saved now for 29 and a half years and God has let me live long enough to see the start of this process. And I don't know about you, but that is, I am so grateful for that. I hope he lets me live long enough to be taken up in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. But here we are, and what are we watching? We are watching the beginnings of what will become the Daniel 9.27 covenant that is confirmed by antichrist this is not that covenant but this is the foundation upon which that covenant is going to sit and you can bet your bottom dollar upon that now we told you yesterday that the only way that israel was going to be able to be a part of this with the united arab emirates was that they had to do two things they had to agree to give up annexation of Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They had to agree to give that up until at least the year 2024, which is three and a half years away from today. And isn't that interesting? Three and a half years. Um, but they had to agree to give that up until 2024. And um, they also had to agree to a two-state solution. That is what Benjamin Netanyahu signed. Now, it's not going to become Israeli law until it's approved by the Knesset in a formal vote. But it's highly, highly, highly likely that it would be. Benjamin Netanyahu would not have come all this way and engaged in such a public spectacle if he wasn't 110% positive that his own government would approve it, and they definitely will. But when we talk about the two-state solution, when we talk about the two-state solution, um, at the beginning of my ministry with Now the End Begins 11 years ago, I was dead set against the two-state solution. I thought it was horrible to divide the land of Israel. But over time, God began to show me um, that it's necessary. And even though God hates it, God is going to allow it. And he is going to um, allow the dividing of Israel because that is what it's going to take for the Jewish people to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, do you remember in Matthew chapter 16 when Peter rebuked Jesus and said he was never going to go to the cross? Matthew 16 um, verses 22 and 23, 24. Matthew 16, 22 through 24. But Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now, why are we talking about Matthew 16? Because when Peter turned to Jesus and he began to understand what the cross was all about, 
his first reaction was to do everything that he could to prevent Jesus from going to the cross. It, it was going to be a humiliation and torture and murder and execution. And it, it's bad on every level from a human perspective. But it's the only way that that payment for sin could be made. Now, in much the same way, I want you to think about the two-state solution. It's horrible to imagine the land of Israel being divided. Um, but without that, there's no pre-tribulation rapture of the church because the timeline can't proceed. The rapture is going to happen to make room for the time of Jacob's trouble. And you can't, if the time of Jacob's trouble is not right around the corner, then there's no rapture. The two are separate, but they're connected. Now, Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 say this. Joel 3, 1 and 2 in your King James Bibles. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. There is your two-state solution. So, why does the battle of Armageddon, which takes place at the end of the tribulation in Revelation 19, what is the purpose for the battle of Armageddon? It's because the land of Israel has been divided and conquered and taken over by Satan himself in the form of Antichrist. In Luke chapter 21, in Luke chapter 21, we read this starting in verse 20. Luke 21, starting in verse 20, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So, if you're a Bible believer... And if you're waiting for the rapture of the church, even though it's, a, it's, it's an unpleasant prospect, you should be very much in favor of the two-state solution. Because without that two-state solution, the Bible timeline does not go forward. And obviously, everything is going to go on God's timeline. There's no question about that. The exact moment that Jesus was crucified was the exact moment that God wanted it to be and had ordained it to be that moment from eternity past. And the rapture of the church, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is going to happen at the exact moment that God has determined for it to take place. It is not dependent on what we do. So it is not like we are rooting for bad things to happen in Israel so that we can be taken up in the rapture. I see that type of uh, uh, those type of statements being made a lot by people who mock Bible believers. They say, oh, you're rooting for World War Three so you can have the rapture. I'm not rooting for any war at all. I'm not rooting for Israel to be divided. But what I am rooting for, I am rooting for the end times Bible prophecy timeline to advance and go forward. Um, and I think that every single Bible believing Christian would agree with that statement because that's our ultimate goal is heaven. That's where you and I, if you're saved... That's where we're going. If you're lost, you're going to hell. And that's a bad prospect. But the good news is you can change that right here, right now. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, that verse is what saved me 
29 and a half years ago. And if you're lost right now, I want you to think about that verse. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him, that's you again, should not perish, meaning to die and to go to hell, but have everlasting life. And if you're saved, then um, you already have everlasting life and you're going to go up at the rapture. But we are not rooting for bad things to happen so Bible prophecy can come true. But we understand that in the end times timeline, there's some very happy things that take place, like the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And there's some very nasty things that take place, like the dividing of Israel and the false peace of Antichrist and the mark of the beast and all these different things that the Bible says is right around the corner. So I said all that to say this. If you're a Bible believing Christian, um, you want the end times timeline to go forward. Now, this covenant that Israel signed yesterday, the Abraham Accords, this covenant is not the Daniel 9.27 covenant, and I'll keep repeating that a few times because um, sometimes people just, they don't hear it right off the bat. It is not the Daniel 9.27 covenant, but it is the foundation upon which the Daniel 9 the Daniel 9.27 covenant will be built. Now, when you turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, turn to Isaiah, chapter 28, and listen to this, starting in verse uh, 14, Isaiah 28.14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. It shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge. Uh, and that's the covenant with Antichrist. And under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation the stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and the hail, the same hail from the book of Job. Remember in chapter 38 where uh, God turns to Job and says, Have you considered the treasures of the hail which I have reserved unto the day of judgment? And... Uh, we see, we see this hail in Joel 38. We see this hail in Isaiah 28. And we also see it, I think it's in Revelation 9, where the, the, the hundred pound hailstones that are burning with fire and dripping with blood are falling from the sky. So everything here in Isaiah 28 is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble leading into the battle of Armageddon. And, um, this is the covenant Isaiah 28, 15, because ye have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. Um, the fourth rider of the four horses of the apocalypse, the pale horse, is death and hell follows behind. All this is connected. And so what happened yesterday is the start of that process. So, Am I saying that right now here, as the church age is coming to an end, have we already seen the preparations being laid on the table for the time of Jacob's trouble? Absolutely 100%. Now, are we in the time of Jacob's trouble? Absolutely not 100%. The church will not spend one single day in the time of Jacob's trouble, but there has to be a time of preparation. Every dispensation has a time of preparation that precedes it. And right now, the church age 
is just about it functionally it's over uh, but dispensationally it has about 30 seconds to midnight and then the church age is going to end in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church but what we are seeing now is the rising spirit of Antichrist. That's why you see all this anger and rioting in the streets and bloodshed and a billion dollars worth of uh, damages to America's major cities and all this fear and intimidation and confusion and noise and chaos. This is the rising spirit of Antichrist. And um, the entire unsaved world is getting ready to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. It is literally right around the corner. It is so close that the leader of Israel yesterday began the preparation process to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. That is what the importance of yesterday was. And you cannot possibly overstate what happened yesterday. It's so important that I'm spending this first half an hour that we normally get up to speed together and 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 uh, we all say hi to each other and we play some songs but what's happening now is so important that I'm taking this this um, half hour of music time and worship time and we're really gonna focus on what happened yesterday and you can't overstate the significance of it it's it's off the charts I, I never thought that I would live long enough to see this day. And many, many, many people uh, commented yesterday, sent me emails, sent me messages, called me up, and um, just shared with me how grateful that they are to be alive during this time and to see these things beginning to come to pass and to realize yesterday that... The preparations for the time of Jacob's trouble became official yesterday. Now, all of that, all of that would be beyond crazy. And then when we consider the rest of this week, tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow? Nothing to do with Bible prophecy um, in particular, but what is scheduled for tomorrow now it may not happen this was something that i kind of kept on the b side and um because sometimes these things happen and eh, sometimes they don't but do you remember back on september 2nd we did an article called anarchist group adbusters calling for a 50-day siege of the white house on september 17th that's tomorrow uniting all the domestic terror groups for the new world order so the same people who started the occupy movement they now want to starting tomorrow then this they have been advertising this for weeks and weeks and weeks now um, but according to their website they're going to be in washington dc tomorrow and they are going to camp out in front of the White House and spark a revolution. That's what they said. They want their exact words are this. White House siege will electrify the U.S. election season, and it doesn't stop there. Drawing wind from the Me Too, BLM, Extinction Rebellion, and other protests uh, we will inspire a global movement of systemic change, a global spring, a cultural heave towards a true world order. And that is the stated mission statement of the Occupy group people who said that they are going to occupy the White House tomorrow. Estevic said that Occupy is a Soros-financed group. That is true, but they're all Soros-financed. He has spent over a billion dollars in the last couple of years financing terror groups. I don't have a link for it, but I read something just two days ago where he is spending another $233 million um, this week, and he's going to give the money to um, radical left-wing domestic terror groups like Black Lives Matter and Me Too and all those people. Now, 
That may or may not happen tomorrow. We'll be keeping an eye on things for you, and we'll certainly let you know if that begins. But let me tell you something that is happening on Friday, and it's a guarantee. On Friday, we have the very first day of Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And it is the first of the three Jewish fall feast days. The Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. All three feasts, they take place in the seventh month, according to Leviticus chapter 23. And we're going to be looking at that tonight. And um, we are going to be focused on those three feast days, the first of which is going to start this Friday in Israel. At the same time, the entire nation of Israel is going to go on a nationwide COVID lockdown. And that COVID lockdown is not going to be lifted until the start of the Feast of Tabernacles on October 2nd. So if you can wrap your head around this, that in the same week, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, signed the Abraham Accords Peace Covenants, which is the foundation of the coming Daniel 927 Covenant. And in the same week, you're going to have the start of the Feast of Trumpets, Israel locked down, and they will not be released until the Feast of Tabernacles. And I don't think I've ever recalled a time in the last 29 years that I've been, I mean, this is something like from an end times movie or a left behind novel. Um, I can, I can not remember a time when Bible prophecy and the news headlines were so absolutely incredibly in tune with each other, but that's where we are. And so these are the things that are taking place this week. And um, on, on top of all that, we have things like we did an article just a couple of hours ago, an article that I wrote with Lori D. from Pennsylvania, uh, who is rapidly becoming one of my co-writers. And I'm so grateful for her uh, ministry and, and for what she does to help out Now the End Begins. And she does an incredible amount of daily research for things. And she brought me this article um, about a George Soros funded group called the Transition Integrity Project. And this is something that the Democrats have in place that they're going to use no matter who wins the election in November. The Transition Integrity Project, financed by George Soros, read the article when you have time, is going to make sure that Donald Trump is removed from the White House, regardless of whether he wins or not. So the plan is, if Donald Trump wins in November, they are just going, because remember, the liberals control 99% of the mainstream media. So... If Donald Trump wins, there's going to be an immediate outcry. They are going to just arbitrarily declare the election to be invalid and illegal. And they have teams in place right now to have Trump removed from the White House, even if he wins. So this is the time period that we are heading into. It is not speculation. It is not uh, clickbait. It is not, I'm not just saying something to get listeners. The, the things that I'm telling you right now are verified absolute facts, and they are happening right now. And the biggest one already happened yesterday. And with that, it's time to get started. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his 
appearance occurred on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time and ask for your blessing on tonight's topic, on this Bible study, on this time in your word, and uh, meet with us, Lord, and bring to my remembrance everything you want me to discuss from your word and from everything you've taught me, Lord, and uh, make me forget the things that are not important. And uh, Lord, I ask you to take control of this study that your will and way and purposes would be accomplished, that people might be saved, the church might be edified, and the lost might be warned of coming judgment. And we commit this time to you, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we set the table in the first half an hour. Crazy, crazy things are happening, but they're fantastic things. If you're a Bible believer, this is like Christmas morning every single day uh, because we're watching Bible prophecy getting in line and getting ready to be fulfilled in a little burst here and a little burst there, and it is absolutely happening. And um, uh, we have to be awake, we have to be aware, we have to be vigilant, but we are living. I told you all through the last half of 2019 that 2020 was going to be the year of prophecy, and it absolutely has. I mean, I probably could have doubled and tripled down on some of the statements that I made in 2020, and I'd still be accurate uh, because these things are absolutely happening and they're absolutely coming to pass. And it's so exciting. And uh, I have waited my entire saved life for this time period. And I'm so glad that God has kept me alive and allowed me to see this. And uh, you should be glad, too, because we're here. And we're commanded to occupy till he comes. And we're not supposed to be uh, holding up in a cave somewhere or hiding out in a bunker or going out into the woods. And uh, I hear a lot of people saying that, that they're, that they're going to go out in the woods. And when it all starts to go down in the major city, they're all going to go hide. Uh, that's not what we're called to do. I mean, if you have to run to the woods to hide, if that's what the Lord's telling you to do, then do it. Um, but by and large, we are called to run into the fray. We're not called to run away from the fight. And what do we say here at now the end begins and have said for the past 11 years, the war is real, the battle hot and the time is short to the fight, to the fight. And that is where we are going. We, we are like those 9-11 first responders. We are not running away from the trouble. We are running into the building. Uh, but instead of the building falling down on top of us, we are going to be lifted up to that top floor and beyond. What do they say in Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond? And that's another great idea that they've stolen from the King James Bible. The idea of going to infinity and beyond. Where do they get that from? Well, they get that from passages like this. First Thessalonians 4.15 For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That is where they get Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond, because that is an excellent description of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Um, So what we're looking at tonight, because Israel is going to be locked down starting on Friday, and that is the first day of the Feast of Trumpets, otherwise known as Rosh Hashanah. And then 10 days later, that goes into Yom Kippur, which is known as the Day of Atonement. And then right after that, just a couple of days later, it goes into the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, um, the Feast of Tabernacles, we remember this from Matthew 17. You're going to need your King James Bible tonight because we are going to be in dozens and dozens and dozens of different places. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 1, and let's take a look at an example of, the, of Tabernacles. Matthew 17, verse 1, and after six days... Six days and then a rest. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment uh, was white as, as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then Peter uh, answered and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You can just picture the dazed look on his face and his head is spinning and he he starts to spout this, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses and one for Elias. Um, Why does Peter want to make three tabernacles for three supernatural beings? Why would he want to do that? Do you think that's just put in the Bible because it sounds good? No. Peter, who is a human being, um, wants to make three booths or tabernacles for Moses, Elijah, who have been long dead at this point, and the glorified Jesus Christ. And what that is a picture of, that is a picture of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, which takes place in the seventh year or the seventh day. Um, Matthew 17, verse 1 said, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother. One year is as the Lord, um, one year is as a thousand, one day is as a thousand years with the Lord. And so we understand that after 6,000 years of creation, we're going to see a pre-trib rapture. We're going to see a seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. And then we're going to see that seventh year, that seventh year of millennial rest. And that takes place um, after the 6,000 years, the pre-trib rapture and the time of Jacob's trouble. And the Feast of Tabernacles points to that millennial rest. Um, But turn to Leviticus chapter 23. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23. And let's read briefly about all seven feast days. And um, we're not going to read straight through, but we'll read just a couple selected portions of Leviticus chapter 23. So let's take a look um at the first four verses of Leviticus 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. That's from Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain. And then Peter wanted to make a tabernacle or a booth because that was a picture of the millennial rest. Leviticus 23.3, six days shall work be done, 
But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So we understand that the book of Leviticus chapter 23 shows us these great seven feasts of the Lord. The first one is the first feast is the Passover. The second feast is the feast of unleavened bread. The third feast is the feast of first fruits. And then there's a gap. And then you have the feast of Pentecost, which is 50 days. So, from the start of first fruits to the end of Pentecost, you have 50 days. And then, so that covers the first three months of the Jewish New Year. In the first month, you have three feasts. Passover, unleavened bread, and fresh, uh, fresh fruits, uh, first fruits. And then in the second month, I'm, I'm sorry. In the second month, you have a gap between the two. And then in the third month, you have the feast of Pentecost. Then in months number four, five, and six, there's nothing. And that we're going to talk about that in a little bit, because dispensationally speaking, that gap between the feast of Pentecost and the feast of trumpets points towards the church age, which has been going on for 2,000 years now. So, the Feast of Pentecost, when that ends, now when Jesus went to the cross, Acts chapter 2, what do we read in Acts chapter 2? Um, turn there for a moment. In Acts chapter 2, we read, and when the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, was fully come, they were with they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting so this is the day of pentecost this is the day um where everything gets started in the book of acts and then of course just five chapters later you would have the close of the kingdom age and the start of the church age so at the end of the third month on the Jewish calendar, when the Feast of Pentecost is finished, there are, there are no feast days in months number four, five, and six. And then in the seventh month, you have three more, just like in the first month you had three feasts. In the seventh month, you have the Feast of Trumpets. In this, uh, you also have the, the, uh, feast of the Day of Atonement, and then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. That all takes place in the seventh month. So, what are we seeing here? We are seeing that this Friday, when Israel goes on lockdown, three days after Benjamin Netanyahu signed the Abraham Accords, uh, Israel is going to start the Feast of Trumpets. Now, uh, you will notice that with the rapture of the church, we have typology and symbology of a trumpet. Turn to um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, I, I want to show you the parallels that we see between the rapture of the church and the regathering of Israel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's read verses 51 through 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, because it's a spiritual kingdom, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now, um, 
a lot of people see the word trumpet and they go right past that word trump and they try to connect first corinthians 15 to the seven angels in revelation who are blowing a trumpet and then they go to matthew chapter 24 where they read turn to matthew chapter 24 and let's see what we find there matthew chapter 24 and this is the favorite section of every post toasty starting in verse 29 Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. This is Joel chapter 3. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is Revelation 19. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they, not Jesus, the angels, you see that wording? Verse 31, and he, Jesus, shall send his angels with a great sound of an actual trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect the Jewish people from the four winds from one end of, of heaven to the other. Now, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we were just a little bit ago. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians four sixteen through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Um, this is a completely different scenario from Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus is directing his angels who are going to be blowing actual trumpets. Here, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Jesus is not sending any angels. He is coming to get us himself. And why? Uh, because of this. Turn to, turn to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. The Apostle Paul talking about the bride of Christ, talking about the church talking about me and you. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that's Jesus Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Jesus, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he comes to get his bride. He does not send an angel. He does not blow a trumpet. But what he does do is he has a voice that makes a sound like a trumpet. Now, I used to be a music teacher. A trump is the sound that a trumpet makes. And I used to play the trumpet back when I had a lot of extra um, wind and I had good cardio. Um but when you play a trumpet and you blow air into the mouthpiece and it goes through the tubes and you press the valves and it comes out of the horn on the other side, that sound that's coming out on the other side is called a trump. So here we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for the Lord himself, no angels, there's no angels here. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. There's no angels to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. One more place. Turn to um, Revelation chapter 4. Turn to Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this I looked. Well, after what? After the end of the church age. 
the church age is Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. And it comes to an end. And the church is not mentioned until chapter 21 with the New Jerusalem. Uh, After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was now watch this, pay attention. And the first voice, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. So John is hearing a trump. John is hearing that same first Thessalonians 416 trump. That's exactly what's happening in Revelation chapter 4. So there are major, major differences between the trumpets that are going to blow for the nation of Israel at the end of the tribulation. Uh, Those trumpets will be blown by angels. They'll be real, actual trumpets, and they will be blown by angels. But when Jesus comes to get his bride... There's no angels involved. At the very least, there's no angels mentioned. So um, we understand that for the church, for the rapture of the church, Jesus is going to come and get us directly. Okay? And his voice, which he is going to call us up into the clouds by the power of his voice, Remember when he stood up on the boat and he said to the winds, peace, be still. And the waves ceased from their roaring and the, and the wind calmed down, right? All Jesus had to do was speak it and it happened. And he is going to call us up into the clouds and we are going to go up there with him. But the Jewish people who are down on the earth, Jesus is going to send an angel for those people because they are not his bride. They're the bride of the Father. God the Father has a bride, and his bride is the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Jesus Christ has a bride and a body, and that's the church that he shed his blood to redeem. And um, so that they are separate. Now, there's similarities, but they are separate. So back to Leviticus chapter 23. Go back to Leviticus chapter 23. And let's take a look at the Feast of Trumpets. Leviticus chapter 23. And let's see here where we can find this. Starting in verse 23. Leviticus 23, 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, that's Friday. Mark that down. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, that's this Friday, the 18th, Ye shall have a Sabbath, that's this Friday, a memorial of blowing trumpets and holy convocation. Um, uh, Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this is the first feast day, what we call the first of the fall feast days. It's the Feast of Trumpets. And this is where it happens practically in the book of Leviticus. And it is a observance that takes place once a year. There is no work that is happening during this time. And this year it's going to take place over a two day period. It's going to start on the 18th. That's a Friday. And it's going to end on the 20th, the first day of the week, which is a Sunday. And, um, Larkin says that Israel is to be regathered back to their own land. We are told in Matthew 24 that they are to be summoned by angelic trumpeters. And uh, that's pretty good for Larkin to be saying that in 1918. Um, And if you've ever read the book Dispensational Truth, you know that all through that book, Larkin calls for the regathering of Israel. And the regathering of Israel would happen 30 years almost to the day 
that Clarence Larkin wrote Dispensational Truth. But what's interesting is if you go back in Christian history, back to the 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 end of the 19th century and the beginning part of the 20th century, the vast majority, um, the vast majority of Bible commenters and commentators said that Israel would never be regathered. But Clarence Larkin was one of the ones that said they absolutely will be. And he thought that it would happen in his lifetime. And he only missed it by 14 years. Clarence Larkin died in 1934, and the nation of Israel was regathered in 1948. But one reason why, um, if you're a, a student of the King James Bible, if you really like to go deep into the Word, um, Dispensational Truth is one of those books that I recommend that everybody get a copy of, because Clarence Larkin was right on the money. And uh, he walked very close with the Lord, and he was calling for the regathering of Israel. And um, he was one of the rare ones because he saw it coming. And uh, he warned and uh, he wrote about it and he taught about that. So the Feast of Trumpets from Leviticus 23.23, it is um, the first feast day that happens after the three-month resting period from the Feast of Pentecost all the way up to the Feast of Trumpets. Now, dispensationally, this three-month period represents the church age because there's no feast days that are happening, and it's no accident that when the church was formed in the New Testament, it came together. Now, it was created at the cross. When Jesus went to the cross and made that payment in his own blood, that is where the church began. But where the church began and when the church age began, that's two separate things. But in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, that is when the Holy Spirit landed on the 120 people in the upper room. So we have perfect harmony between the New Testament day of Pentecost and the start of the church age in Acts chapter 7 um, with the end of the feast day of Pentecost at the end of the third Jewish month, followed by three months that is typified as the church age where there is no resting. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we are called to work. We are not called to rest. Sunday is not a day of rest for the Christian. If you're a Christian, if you're a born-again Bible believer, Sunday is a day that you should be busy about the Lord's business. Um, and, and that's why we go to church on a Sunday. A lot of people tell me that the reason why Christians go to church on a Sunday, it's because of the Roman Catholic Church changed everything. Well, those people have never read places like Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, that's a communion service. Paul preached, that's a church service. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech, that's preaching, until midnight. So, um, they never read that section. And uh, they never read places like 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. And upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. That's a church collection. So, it is no accident that in the New Testament that the church is started, that it is all that begins right around the day of Pentecost. And then when we look at the Jewish feast days, we see that at the end of the feast of Pentecost, we have this time period where no resting is taking place. It is nothing but work. And then the very next feast day is the Feast of Trumpets. And with that, we have to take a quick break.
But don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're just getting warmed up. We are just getting started. And um, uh, I, I hope that this study is really, really going to be a blessing for you because it is so crazy timely with what we're experiencing here in America and around the world with everything that's taking place this week. Man, oh man, um, the Bible, prophecy, and the headlines, they are merging and it's fascinating to see. We'll be right back in three minutes and 26 seconds. Don't go away. Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It's not your blood that will take away sin. It's The Bible says it is impossible. Can't be done. It is impossible that the, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Um, Jesus was that sacrifice. And um, he took upon himself the sin of every person who had ever lived, who ever would live. And he made that payment in his own blood. And the Bible says we've been bought with a price. And that price is blood. If you're just tuning in, we're talking tonight about the Jewish feast days that take place in the fall at the start of the seventh month, which is this Friday. Uh, this Friday, September 18th, 2020, is going to be um, the start of the Feast of Trumpets. Now, Turn to Numbers chapter 10 
and let's take a look at trumpets and what they're used for and how it relates to the Feast of Trumpets. And we read all about that in Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. So let's read um, what we find there. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shall thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. So what was the trumpet for? It was to call the camp. It was to call them to Jerusalem. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When ye blow the alarm the second time, then the camps that lie in the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be, here it is, here's the Feast of Trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets and ye shall be remembered before the lord your god and ye shall be saved from your enemies also in the day of your gladness they're glad because they're saved from their enemies Aren't you glad to be saved from the penalty of sin and death aren't you glad to be saved from an eternal hell that's your enemy. Death is your enemy. Hell is your enemy. And if you're born again, you've been saved from your enemies. Uh, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord, your God. So, Numbers chapter uh, 10, verses 1 through 10, we read about... The blowing of the trumpets, two silver trumpets that were made with the atonement money of the people. And this trumpet was to be to gather the people to the tabernacle, which, of course, eventually became Jerusalem in Israel. Now, have you ever wondered why the entire Middle East peace process hinges on one thing and one thing only? If you had a guess, what do you think that the um, entire Middle East peace process hinges on? Well, if you read your Bible, then you know that it hinges on um, who controls the nation of Jerusalem. Now, there's a reason for this. Isaiah chapter 14 Let's start reading in verse 12, Isaiah 14, um, 12 through 15, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How thou art cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars, that's the angels of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And here's how he winds up. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So, the reason why you have the entire Middle East peace process, why the Palestinians have never signed a peace deal with the Jews. It's not because they've never been made some good offers, because they have been made some very good offers. But every offer that they have ever made centered around the fact that they wanted all of Jerusalem for a Palestinian state. 
the devil says he wants what God has. And what does God have? God has Jerusalem. That is the place where God has placed his name. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that he, that God says, um, he says, I have placed my name in Jerusalem. And because of that, that's what the devil wants. He wants what God has. And um, that's why in Luke chapter 21, in Luke chapter 21, it says, And when ye see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Why does the devil want to overthrow Jerusalem? Because it is the city of God. Israel is the country of God. Jerusalem is, the, it's, it's called the city of the great king. It's called the city of David. It's called the city of God. And there is no other place on the face of the earth um, other than Jerusalem that God connects his name with. In 1 Kings 11.36, we read this, And unto his son will I give one tribe that David my servant may have a light alway before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. That's 1 Kings 11.36. In 2 Kings 21.4, And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. That's 2 Kings 21.4. And then in 2 Kings 21.7, we read, and he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, in the first temple, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. So, the reason why there is no peace in the Middle East is because the Palestinians want Jerusalem and the Jews want Jerusalem. That is the stone of contention. And what happened yesterday with the signing of the Abraham Accords, that is going to begin to pave the way for what is going to be the peace treaty between the Palestinians and the Jewish people. They're working their way around. They're taking small bites. When I was a kid and it would snow in New Jersey, and uh, we had this long driveway. It was about 75 feet long, and it ended in a big, wide section. And every time that it snowed, my father would make me and my four brothers go outside, and he would make us shovel the snow. And I would just, I would look at that driveway and it was such a long, I, I couldn't even see the end of it. And my dad could see the look of discouragement on my face. And he would just look at me and say, take small bites and it will go fast. And that's exactly what's happening now with the Abraham Accords. Rather than trying to ram this thing home between the Palestinians and the Jews they finally, Jared Kushner, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, Jared Kushner finally figured it out. Instead of trying to ram home this peace treaty directly between the Jews and the Palestinians, what they're doing is they're making a peace treaty with the United Arab Emirates. Check one. A peace treaty with Bahrain, Muslim nation. Check two. And... Saudi Arabia, Trump said, is going to be coming into the Abraham Accords very soon. And if you were to look on a map, and if you would make the nation of Israel a blue circle, and make the Palestinians a red circle, and then make all the other circles green, in every Muslim nation that surrounds Israel and the Palestinians, 
And what they're going to do is they're going to populate the Abraham Accords until there are so many Muslim nations who have signed a peace treaty under the name of Abraham with the Jews that getting the Palestinians to finally push them over the edge, it's going to be a piece of cake. And and for the last 72 years, they have tried directly to force a peace between the Jews and the Palestinians, and it fails every single time. But now they got smart. Now they're going to surround the Palestinians with Muslim nations who signed the Abraham Accords with the Jewish people, and soon it's going to be overwhelming. Carl is asking, are the um, Palestinians... The Philistines, yes, that's where the name Palestine comes from. It comes from, um, it was a slur, the, the name of Palestine for the nation of Israel came after the Romans destroyed Israel uh, in 70 AD when they burned down the temple. And, and, um, uh, the Romans knew that the Philistines were the arch enemy of the Jewish people, and so they called this new land, which was basically destroyed Israel, they called it Palestine as a reference to their eternal enemy, the Philistines, uh, and that's where the giants were. But if you remember, if you read your Bible, you read the book of Joshua, the Philistines were not the only enemy of the Jewish people. Uh, Israel, before God gave it to the Jews, was called what? It was called the land of Canaan. We did an article back on August 19th of 2019 with this headline, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas now claims that they are the biblical Canaanites. Zechariah tells them what their fate shall be. And this is what Mahmoud Abbas said last year. We are the Canaanites, he said. We will remain in our homeland, and the outsiders on this land have no right in this country. The land is for its inhabitants. This land is for the Canaanites who were here 5,000 years ago, and we are the Canaanites. And that's what Mahmoud Abbas said on August 19th, a little over a year ago in 2019. Now, turn to Zechariah 14 and let's see what the fate of the Canaanites is going to be when Jesus returns. Zechariah 14 verses 20 and 21. If they want to say that they're the Canaanites, that's perfectly fine with me, that really neatens up a lot of loose ends. Zechariah 14, 20 says, In that day, the day that Jesus returns, there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe or cook therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So, if Mahmoud Abbas wants to make his Palestinian brothers the original Canaanites, if they want to say that they are descendants of the Canaanites, we actually have some pretty good Bible harmony because it was the Canaanites that the Jewish people were told by God to drive out and they drove them out and they took over the land of Israel and David became their king. But Zechariah says when Jesus returns, there will be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So what does that mean? That means there has to be Canaanites in the time of Jacob's trouble. Because they can't be driven out when Jesus returns if they're not there. So when Mahmoud Abbas says 
They're the Canaanites. That's fine with me. Check it right off the list. Now we have another piece of the puzzle that's all put together. So to wrap up what the Feast of Trumpets is all about, the Feast of Trumpets is that day from Numbers 10 where the Jewish people were to gather at the tabernacle And we understand that to be in Jerusalem. And so the Feast of Trumpets is a call to the Jewish people to gather and to get ready and to prepare. That's what that is about. So that when they battle, that they're going to have the Lord's blessing. Uh, Numbers 10, 9 says, and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God and ye shall be saved from your enemies. So the feast of trumpets is calling the Jews back to Jerusalem. And this year, the entire nation is going on lockdown. So You remember all those verses that I read to you in the last half an hour talking about the difference between the pre-tribulation rapture of the church and the rapture of the tribulation saints at the end of the tribulation? They have actual trumpets that are blown by angels. We have the, the voice of Jesus Christ, which Paul says is the trump of God. We don't get a trumpet. We don't get angels. We get something much, much, much better. We get Jesus Christ with his voice calling us up. So according to Larkin, Larkin, in his estimations, he puts the rapture right around the time of the Feast of Trumpets uh, because he, he looks at that fourth, fifth, and sixth month of resting after the Feast of Pentecost in the third month. And he says that that typifies the church age. And then at the Feast of Trumpets, the Jewish people are called, and they're going to be called into the time of Jacob's trouble. And we are going to hear the voice as of a trumpet. So um, when you read on Facebook and on Twitter, a lot of people talking about, could the rapture be happening during the Feast of Trumpets? And the answer is yes, it absolutely could. Now, I tend to side with this um, more on Ruckman's side, where he spoke about the rapture of the church taking place in the springtime. And one of the reasons why is when you go into the um, Song of Solomon chapter 2 and you see this great relationship between um, the bride and her beloved, we see an amazing reference to what could possibly be the rapture of the church and what could also possibly be uh, the rapture of the tribulation saints in Matthew 24. Uh, So turn to Song of Solomon chapter 2, and let's take a listen to what Solomon has to say in verses 10 through 13. Song of Solomon chapter 2, 10 through 13. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, and the time of the singing of the birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now that sounds suspiciously like... um, The Apostle John in Revelation chapter 4, where he hears the words, Come up hither, and he is called up and away to the throne room of God. Um, So, you could make a case for a springtime rapture, 
and you can make a case for a rapture that would take place around the Feast of Trumpets. But one thing is for sure, whichever side of the fence that you fall upon, one thing is absolutely positively for sure. As the church is taken up in the rapture, whether it's in the springtime or whether it's in the fall, whether it happens around the time of the Feast of First Fruits or it happens around the time of the Feast of Trumpets, the church has got to be removed in order for Israel to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. But as we saw yesterday, we see how very, very, very crazy close that we are to that time period happening. And that's why I said in in the first half an hour that you shouldn't be so alarmed when you hear about a two-state solution. It is going to happen. It will not be stopped. It cannot be stopped. This is a guarantee. And it's not a guarantee because it's my opinion. And it's not a guarantee because I say so. It's a guarantee because in places like the book of Joel in chapter 3, we see in verse 2 of Joel 3, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Uh, if you have a highlighter or if you can underline those verses and parted my land, that is the two state solution. And that is what is going to be taking place. So don't bother praying against it uh, because that is a useless prayer. It will not be prayed away. What you should pray for first and primarily you should pray that God gives you strength to be a witness, to be a bold witness with whatever time we have left. That should be your number one prayer, that you can witness to lost people and see them get saved. Secondly, your prayer should be for the Jewish people that um, some will come to salvation and that God's hand will remain on them as they go through the time of Jacob's trouble. That would be an excellent prayer for you to pray. Because if you're a born-again Christian, you should love the Jewish people. You should love the nation of Israel. Yes, they are far from God. Yes, they do third-term late trimester abortions. Yes, Tel Aviv is the LGBTQ capital of the world. I get all that. No problem. That's exactly where they should be if they're getting ready to go through the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. If Israel was not doing those things, we wouldn't even be close. So, not that we rejoice in those things, because we don't. We absolutely do not. But what we do rejoice in is as we see these things, we understand that the time is very, very close. Israel, everything that Israel is doing is exactly what they should be doing to prepare for the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, remember what Jeremiah says in chapter 29, Jer just one page before the prophecy that concerns the time of Jacob's trouble. For thus saith the Lord, Jeremiah 29.10, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The expected end for the Jewish person is the kingdom. Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? It is not for you to know the times or seasons. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, 8 through 14. Um... Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? In order to get that kingdom, they've got to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And, and 
when they went into the Babylonian captivity, God said, I'll wait 70 years and I'll come visit you. Well, we're at year number 72 and the process is already well underway. We are right on track. We have to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. back for the last half hour of tonight's program. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about the Jewish fall feast days. We've been talking about the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles. We kind of started with the Feast of Tabernacles first and worked our way back. Now, Roxanne had a question during the break, and she wants to know, how does Ezekiel 38 and 39 fit in with 1 Thessalonians 5.3. So turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.3, and let's look at verse, well, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, that's the second coming, not the rapture of the church, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Now, 
Roxanne's question is, where does Ezekiel 38 and 39 fit in with 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, the time of false peace and false safety, which is the first three and a half years of the time of Jacob's trouble? Now, the first thing that we have to understand about Ezekiel 38 and 39 is that those two chapters show you two different battles. They do not end the same. They are not the same battle. And God, for whatever his reasons are, he put the last battle first in chapter 38, and then he puts the first battle last in chapter 39. Now, one of the prophecy clues that we connect with chapter 39 of Ezekiel so that we understand that this is talking about the battle of Armageddon at the end of the Great Tribulation, Ezekiel 39, verses 4 and 17. Ezekiel 39, 4 and 17. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and all the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. And thou son of man, th thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come and gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. So Ezekiel chapter 39 Verses 4 and 17, God is calling to the birds of prey that are flying in the air over Jerusalem. He is telling them to come and eat the supper of the great king from Revelation 19. Now take a look at Revelation 19, 17 and 18. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may... This is the same thing from Ezekiel 39 that I just read to you. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye, the birds, may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now, just for fun, turn to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll put the cherry on top of this thing. Uh, Matthew 24, we read this about this exact same time period from Ezekiel 39 and Revelation 19. Look at verses 26 through 28 of Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 26 through 28. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, when you take Ezekiel 39, and you take Revelation 19, and you take Matthew 24, it is talking about the exact same subject in all three of those sections. So we understand, we understand that Ezekiel chapter 39 is dealing with the battle of Armageddon that takes place at the, at the end of the Great Tribulation. Now Roxanne's question was, what does 1 Thessalonians 5.3 and when they shall p say peace and safety, then travail shall come upon them um, as on a woman with childbirth, <laughs> um, and they shall not escape. That part, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, is at the end of the first half of the time of Jacob's trouble. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 is when 
Uh, now go back to Matthew chapter 24. First Thessalonians 5, 3. Go back to um, Matthew chapter 24, and we read this. Um, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea. The Jews aren't going to be in Judea now because... Netanyahu just signed that away. They're not annexing Judea like they were supposed to back in July. They have signed away the annexation of Judea for the Abraham Accords. They're going right into the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. That is is 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Ezekiel 39 is the battle of Armageddon. So uh, that's where it takes place on the timeline. That's where it takes place on the timeline. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians 5.3 is the middle section in the time of Jacob's trouble. The first three and a half years is the time of false peace and false safety. Where does that false peace and false safety come from? The Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords that started with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and spread to Saudi Arabia and then is going to spread to Dubai and Iraq. It's going to spread to all the different Muslim nations. It's going to create the uh, necessary room for the actual covenant that will be confirmed, Daniel 9.27, by Antichrist. And 1 Thessalonians 5.3 is the middle time period between the start of Jacob's trouble and the start of the Great Tribulation. Um 1 Thessalonians 5.3 breaks those two right down the middle. And at the end of the Great Tribulation, you have Ezekiel chapter 39. And then just quickly, um, Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 is talking about something completely different. Uh, let's read Ezekiel 38 verses 8 and 11. Ezekiel 38, verses 8 and 11. And after many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. It's talking about the millennial kingdom. Against the mountains of Israel, which has always been laid waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. This is the millennial rest. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, and they shall say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Why is there no walls? Because it's the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You don't need walls when Jesus is there. I will go to them that are at rest, them that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and neither bars nor gates. Now, that's Ezekiel 38, verses 8 and 11, talking about a time when the Jewish people had been regathered into a, 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 a land with no walls, and everybody is dwelling in peace and safety. Um, this is not false peace and safety. This is the peace and safety under, anti, uh, under Jesus Christ. But Antichrist, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 and 9. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breath of the earth and can pass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God and devoured them. So when Ezekiel says, after many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, it is brought back from the battle of Armageddon from Ezekiel 39. And Ezekiel 
38 is giving you the battle of Gog and Magog, which we see in Revelation chapter 20. The battle of Gog and Magog cannot take place until the end of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So, the time period between Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 is a little over a 1,000 year period. So, there is not just one big battle at the end. There is going to be the battle of Armageddon that's going to take place at the end of the Great Tribulation. There's going to be the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And then there's going to be the very brief battle of Gog and Magog, which will be put down immediately. Jesus is simply allowing it to happen just so everybody can come out of the shadows. Everybody can declare whose side that they're actually on. And it's over and it's done. It is not like a real battle because, uh, Fire comes down from heaven and just destroys everything. That is not the case with the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. Jesus physically mounts up on a white horse. We mount up on white horses with him. Turn to Revelation 19. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Revelation 19. And let's start reading... Um, 11 through 15. Revelation 19, 11 through 15. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. This is not like the counterfeit white horse from Revelation 6, 1. This is the real white horse and the real king. Um, and in righteousness, he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, not just one crown. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress and fierceness uh, and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And then you see the very next verse is the supper of the great king. Um, so, this is what happens at the end of the Battle of Armageddon. So Watchman is saying, it sounds like I believe that Ezekiel 38 is at the end of the millennium, and Ezekiel 39 is Armageddon at the end of the 70th week. That is absolutely 100% true. That is exactly what I'm saying. And I've repeated that multiple times. Uh, I told you that... You had to keep the chatting in the chat room to a minimum because we were going deep tonight and we have gone very, very deep. And um, uh, I'm, I am going to put the link into the chat room one more time. And I, I urge you to read this article when you have the time. If you are not... Um, listening to this program live, you can go to nowtheendbegins.com and just go to the search bar and type in Ezekiel 39 and this article will come right up for you. But to answer the question emphatically, am I saying that Ezekiel chapter 38 is the battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium? And am I saying that Ezekiel 39 is the battle of Armageddon at the end of the Great Tribulation? Absolutely, 100%. You can take it to the bank. And when you read the article, when you read the article that I wrote, and I spent a lot of time researching it, um, I've talked about it briefly tonight, but I could spend two hours 
just on showing you how the two battles in Ezekiel are not the same. They're not even close to being the same. They have two separate conclusions, and I've already given you the references which prove that Ezekiel 39 is Armageddon and Ezekiel 38 is the battle of Gog and Magog. They are two separate battles and they are two separate wars and they are separated by a thousand year period of time. So just to conclude, we were talking tonight about the, about the feast days and we were talking about how the Jewish fall feast days, which start Friday, and the Feast of Trumpets is going to be from September 18th to September 20th, and then 10 days later, you're going to have the Day of Atonement and Yom Kippur, and that's going to take place from the 28th to the 30th. And then you're going to have on October 2nd, you're going to have the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of Trumpets calls the Jewish people into a time of trouble. And uh, that is what, from a, a, a prophetical perspective, that is what is going to be the the hallmark, whether it's this year or next year. Uh, I am not saying uh, absolutely that this Friday the Jewish people are going to be going into the time of Jacob's trouble and the rapture is happening. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that the Feast of Trumpets is the time when the Jews are called back to Jerusalem and there's a battle. And then, of course, the Day of Atonement we read about that. Uh, that's the day where the Jewish, the sins of the Jewish people have finally been taken away. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 11. We still have a couple of minutes. Let's just go there for a moment. Um, Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 27. Romans 11, 25 through 27. Um, Think about this for the Day of Atonement on September 28th. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant, when I shall take away their sins. That is typified by the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Now, that's currently celebrated, um by that's the day that the Jewish people confess their sins, their yearly repentance, and um, they believe that God takes away their sins. But that really is merely symbolic. The only way that God can take away your sins right now is you've got to become born again. And um, uh, simply having a day of atonement doesn't cut it. We are still in the church age, and um, salvation by grace through faith doesn't matter whether you're Jewish, doesn't matter whether you're Gentile. If you want to have your sins forgiven and taken away, um, you need to get saved. But during the time of Jacob's trouble, they are going to have to endure until the end is what they're going to have to do. Um, and we're just about out of time for today. I hope this study was a blessing for you, and I really hope that um, I put a lot of links into the chat room tonight. Uh, I really hope that you will study these things out and see the importance of, of I mean, it is, it's just crazy that Israel is going to be locked down for all three of the feast days in the seventh month of the year, in the same week that they signed the Abraham Accords. Um, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. Actually, if nothing happens, if nothing big happens, it will be an absolute shock to me because 
the way that this year has been going, the way that this week has been going, uh, something, something, something's got to happen. Um, but with that, we're out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of this ministry. Uh, please remember to pray for my friend, Br- Brother Jesse, who is battling stage four uh, cancer. Pray for him and his wife, Judy. Uh, and please keep me in your prayers. I don't normally say that, but... Um, uh, just keep me in your prayers that the Lord would keep me strong and he would allow me to get my health under control. And um, I love doing this program and I love meeting uh, by way of internet with all of you. And uh, this is the ministry that God has called me to. And I'm so glad that you're here with me. Um, Lord willing, we'll see you back here Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time for another edition of Rightly Dividing. Have a good day, everybody. And hey, watch out and see if tomorrow the um, all those domestic terrorists are actually going to be gathering in Washington. If they are, we will be covering it around the clock for you. And uh, Friday, we're going to have a very special prophecy uh, podcast because it's going to be the day that Israel gets put on lockdown and it's going to be the start of the Feast of Trumpets. Good night, everybody. Thank you.